Welcome back to the Discovering Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Our guest today is managing partner of King's Capital, George Giannopoulos. George, it's a pleasure having you on today. Thank you for doing this again. Thank you for having me, John. It's a pleasure. Of course. So before we talk business, tell the audience a little bit, a b- a bit about yourself. So where are you from and why did you get into this industry? Sure. So I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Come from Greek descent, first generation American. Grew up um, in South Brooklyn. Um, went to college at St. John's University. High school was Severian, another private school. Um, real estate kind of came secondary. I, I graduated with a finance degree and quickly realized that I didn't want to do corporate America. Right. It, was the, it was January of 02, right after September 11. The job market wasn't the best. And a lot of my friends who had, you know, similar grades and they weren't really getting the jobs they wanted. So, you know, followed the footsteps of my family, got involved with the family business, which is flower shop, completely different from separate. finance, <laughs> separate, completely different animal. But um, my father had a successful business and it was uh, by default where I got into it. I wanted to be an entrepreneur and kind of make that business a little more corporate. Fast forward um, some years down the road, I helped out a little bit with the properties, managing, leasing, et cetera. And, Quickly got my license after that as an agent and, you know, progressed as a, as a broker and now a principal. Awesome. Amazing. And um, I want to understand where you kind of first develop your sense of business. So if you had to think back to the first time you remember selling something, what comes to mind? So, I mean, uh, I was probably a child, five or six years old, where I used to take little trinkets from my dad's shop and try to sell them on the corner. Mm. I don't even know if anybody bought them or not, but I, there's <laughs> photos of me on the corner selling things. And, oh, awesome. Yeah, and fast forward, I guess in, in college, I used to tutor kids in math. I had pretty strong suit. That was my strong suit. So oh, wow. I tutored, yeah, elementary kids, you know, for a decent amount of money in, awesome. in, in college, yeah. <laughs> That's sick. And um, y- you went to college for finance. Um, how did that kind of prepare you for what you're doing today? So... Numbers, I mean, real estate is it's a numbers thing. You have to understand, you know, modeling and debt and things like that. But finance, the, the, the stuff that I learned, I wouldn't say there's too much value in the real estate outside of understanding math. But mm. what college did do for me was it teaches you how to think and be disciplined and just kind of get you on some sort of on a road to, to how to think and operate in, in the real world. Understood. So more of a mindset. More of a mindset. Understood. Yeah. Okay. And um, can you talk a little bit about, about your experience working as a rental broker? How did that kind of prepare you for your position today? So funny story is just to kind of circle back. I, I go back to these moments when I, my first, when I first got out of the family business. It was uh, kind of a big step. I was in my early 30s and didn't want to stay there and just kind of wanted to pick, you know, pick my own path and renting apartments was just the easiest thing to do to make quick money. Right. I remember going up and down the street, printing paper, scotch taping the, the apartments on the wall so they didn't want to spend money on Craigslist <laughs> at the time, which, uh, which is pretty funny looking back on it. But um, fast forward as we grew that business, it helped me to understand the psychology of, of a landlord and what they look mm. for in tenancy and what not to look for, more importantly, how to filter out, how to screen. Um, and to today, you know, we're, we're doing on the value add space, it's it's understanding layouts, what renters look for, and what we can do as an owner to extract the most value out mm. of the tenant. Understood. Okay. And can you walk us through the mission of King's Capital? What's your kind of long-term vision for this company? So King's Capital is a value-add, multifamily, mixed-use firm. We own and operate in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and out of state. The goal is, I guess, long-term, just to kind of just do far, uh, of, I guess, a far outreach of where I see this going. You know, we, we are active in Texas, and mm. the goal is to be in Florida and some other states as well. Uh, I'm of Greek descent, like I previously mentioned. My goal is to mimic what I'm doing here in Greece. I, have a, I, I love being there. It's like no place on earth. Awesome. It's paradise on earth. I, yeah. If you haven't been there, I recommend going. And for your listeners, I highly recommend it. Awesome. But it's definitely paradise on earth. And um, the goal is to have an office in Greece, Florida, New York, obviously, and just grow the platform. And, you know, our goal is to be have a billion under management. Mm, okay, great. Awesome. And for someone who's getting started, how can somebody with no track record, no connections, no experience get started in this business? So the easiest thing I would recommend is find a mentor. Just find somebody who's, who's done this before and mm. understands the business, you know, whether it be a broker or a landlord. Work for free. 
you know, and learn the business. I, I, I chose the, the latter. I taught myself. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't do the proper training, and mm. it's probably my one regret that I didn't. I probably could have fast forwarded a lot of, a lot of my success if I had gone to, say, a bigger broker shop to learn. Just the ins and outs of the business and mm. being trained properly, you know. So I think working with a a working with a mentor or like a, one of the bigger shops, broker shops, I think can provide great sort of guidance, a stepping stone. I don't know if that's the, the long launching term, plan, yeah. but I think for the meantime to get your feet wet and learn the business, I think that's the best way to go. Understood. Got it. And for do you choose different investors for each deal that you kind of invest in, or is there a core group that invests in everything? So, for the most part, we have a lot of our repeats, you know, that come in from deal to deal that are comfortable with us, you know, that understand our process, understand how we underwrite, you know, and one phrase I always use is, which I think is, pertains to real estate and a sponsor, you're investing in the jockey, not the horse, the mm. horse being the deal, Right. the jockey is the guy who runs the deal, and as much as an underwriting looks great, a deal looks great, a dress looks great. You have to bet on the operator to, to execute his business plan. Right. And more importantly, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's underwriting. A lot of things are assumptions and things pop up on a deal and you have to have a, a good sponsor that's able to, to pivot and execute and, and make a deal work. You know, so a lot of our guys feel confident in us, but for the most part, we we make it a goal to bring in new investors per deal. Um, in my experience, as you do well for people, they'll they'll roll with you and just awesome. And that's that's been our approach. great. And how how would you how would you say what are the ingredients of a good sponsor? What kind of goes into that? Ingredients of a good sponsor. So knowing your numbers is one thing. Knowing how to maximize understanding different debt structures and how they can alter a deal. Honesty, integrity, transparency. Um, those I think were the main highlights okay. of, of which separate a good sponsor. Great. And as, as far as a capital partner, what's your ideal kind of capital partner to work with? The ideal capital partner for us is somebody that's interested in growing their wealth passively for obvious reasons. Right. We believe that um, the ideal partner is someone that has a great business doing whatever they may be, whether it be an athlete, a doctor, a finance guy that have their day to day and they do, do it very well but don't have the time or the wherewithal to, For the extra stuff. to operate a property because right. you know, anybody could buy a property, but not everyone knows how to maximize a property. So the ideal guy is somebody that just wants to grow their wealth and not really have the time to, to delegate towards that. Understood, okay. Um, and how did you kind of leverage rejection from uh, investors in your first few deals to kind of reevaluate your strategy? So, when you get rejected or turned down from an investor, I don't look at that as so much as a failure mm. because at the end of the day, you know, you, you have to put yourself in everyone's shoes and understand that not whatever, not what necessarily what you assume is, is always the case. So uh, no necessarily may not, it may mean a not now, you know, so understanding, dissecting that no, it can go a long way to understanding, you know, why this doesn't work for them and right. what would work and, just learn from that. Understood. Okay. And let's say somebody watching this right now just graduated college and wants to be a real estate entrepreneur. Would you recommend for them to go straight out of college, start the business, or should they work at a shop like CBRE or JLL? I made, I made, that's, I made that mistake of going off on my own. You know, I had a friend that was a lawyer, and I watched, I let's remember the Barbara Corcoran story where she paid someone to activate a license. <laughs> I did the same thing. You know, I operated as an agent under my friend who was a lawyer, and didn't have that training. So I pounded phones and learned in hustles. I went to events and the path that it took me to get to a point where I was comfortable in my space took, took some time. So right. I would recommend really working, depending on what you want to do. You have, that's the first question to ask. Do you want to be an agent? Do you want to be, you know, because real estate is such a, it's such a broad field, right? Mm -hmm. There's, on the commercial side, there's, there's leasing, there's sales, there's, there's office leasing, there's retail leasing. So understanding what you want to do and what part of the business interests you most, you know, 
that would be that would be my advice if it's if you want to be on the ownership side mm. be an intern work for an owner you know learn how they look at deals you know pick do whatever you ask and you know and then go try from there. to yeah go, go from there and little by little you know we have guys in our office that we empower them to get involved and you know their goal is to make them juniors at some point and they're all little by little all my guys have have invested with us so mm. You know, so I think that's the right way to, that's my advice. Got it. So kind of like working under someone who has a proven strategy that works with the market and kind of fast tracking your way to success with Basically, that. Basically, yeah, I think, okay. I think that's, that's the quickest way. Okay. And um, so George, I spoke with your partner, Jeffrey, um, before this, and he told me you have a very structured mental process uh, that you go through every morning to keep your thoughts uh, organized and your brain sharp. Can you kind of walk us through the day, the day, uh, day in the life of George? Sure. So yeah, <laughs> Jeff loves to talk about that. Um, so for me, my my morning routine typically starts from the night before. You know, I've always been in the um, always been an athlete, enjoyed sports, working out. Um, it wasn't until 2017 where I really got into the personal development space. Uh, went to Tony Robbins UPW, which was uh, you know I'll use the word life changing because mm. just being in that room, that environment, and understanding what's capable and that you're fully empowered and able to control your own thoughts, it, it goes a long way. Mm. Um, so for me, implementing what I've learned f from him and books and podcasts, you know, so just to touch on just my routine, usually, like I, I do a lot in the morning, which I'll touch in a second. So it starts typically with the night before with a good night's sleep, knowing that I need to uh, be sharp in the morning. I try to get six to seven hours, no okay. less than six, uh, which means I'm usually knocked out by 10.30 for okay. the most part, which is makes me sound old, but <laughs> it is what it is. Company comes first right now. Right. Um, I try to have my clothes out ready, knowing what I'm going to wear, so it's the one less thing to think about. Um, wake up first thing, usually between 5.30 and 6. I'll meditate for 15 minutes or so. I try to do my prayers. I read, usually a personal development book. 15 to 20 minutes. I have a journal, which I typically I write things that are on my mind mm. or it's something with business. And I find that my mind is the most clear at that time. Mm. You know, it's like six something in the morning, you don't hear a car on the road and I'm alone in my house and I'm able to do what I want. Then I'll head to the gym around 7, 7.15. I'll work out for 90 minutes, come home, shower and go to work. So I, by the time I start my day in the office, I feel pretty- You've already done pretty, so much. Pretty productive, yeah. Okay. And it honestly gives me peace. Like I feel, I get my endorphins going, I'm relaxed, and um, yeah, it just allows me to be zen for the most part. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. And you mentioned this uh, journal that you have. Um, Jeff also mentioned you have a gratitude journal. How do you kind of, um, how would you say that uh, shifting your uh, mindset to gratitude kind of impacts your life and your business? So that's a Tony Robbins thing. <laughs> I reference him a lot because I can't take credit for it, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's virtually impossible to be grateful and sad or angry exactly, at the same yeah. time you know yeah. so shifting my mind to something in the morning and i typically try to focus on and again i journal i typically try to write small things everyone can be grateful for the big things the deal we just closed you know the investor that came in the broker i just met and you know i try to focus on little things and just realizing that gratitude can just it just puts me in such a positive mood where it just sets me up just to be productive and happy because it takes that negative emotion you know because at the end of the day, we have a conscious and a subconscious. Your right. subconscious, unfortunately, can control you. Right. So understanding how to limit that because you, you can't rewire it. You can't get rid of it, but yeah, rewire it where it's you're you know knowing that you have a control of that. It's a choice. Everything's a choice. One hundred percent. My what I choose to think is my is my my is my option. One hundred percent. And um, Jeffrey also mentioned that you have um, a particular talent when it comes to repositioning an asset and uh, finding angles with your properties. Can you walk us through, like, give us an example of a deal where you thought um, outside of the box and came up with a creative, creative solution? Sure. So we have a property that's down the road from here, 140 Mulberry, which we, we bought during COVID. And um, this particular asset was very unique. It had a front house, five-story apartment building. And had a rear carriage house, which was empty for, I think, 60 plus years or something. It was basically condemned. We had to sign waivers to get in. Mm. The taxes on that property were only 35000 mm. In New York, anything over 10 units classifies on the RPIE, which can be a, a killer. Um, 
previous uses for that property were eight, I think it was eight, 16 units in the front and eight in the back, which were brought to 24 units. And most people look at that as, as a great thing. Wow, I just got, yeah. you know, a bunch of units th that I didn't know about. But we realized that the delta in the taxes would certainly negate the profit you would have made by having more units. So what we did was be creative with the unit mix. Mm. We made two twos, three ones, and four twos. We had some duplex units, which essentially brought us to a very high gross income, mm. uh, but we're also able to keep our taxes, taxes low. Yeah. very low. So I think my taxes today are around 40,000, mm. you know, for, I don't even want to say what the income is, but yeah, it's, right. it's it, we're very lucky. Okay, understood. And <clears throat> can you walk us through a deal where you were, that you were very confident in that didn't really go as planned? Um, what would you have done differently? So I guess I can reference the same building. Um, this building actually, so what we did here was we pushed the closing, it was during COVID, and we offered the seller we realized that our downtime was a lot less. And what we did was push our closing date back to the springtime. So we came to market in the summer of 22. Mm. Um, we paid their carrying costs, which was minimal. And it gave us that perfect window to come to market in July of August of last year, which we did. That particular instance didn't go totally as planned. We did everything right. We fully leased out. We got our TCOs and when we went for our final sign-off, Department of Buildings came back, and this is a unique story. I don't know if it's going to happen to anybody else, but we did, as per plan, DOB came back and said, you know, um, these plans shouldn't have been stamped and approved, and they made us change things afterwards. Oh, wow. And nothing to do with us. We did everything exactly by, by code, and wow. they made us change things, which unfortunately had to cancel leases, and we had to come to market at a much different time. Thankfully, we still did all right, but we weren't able to achieve that uh, those crazy rents that were happening in the summer. But summer 2024 is around the corner. I think we'll be yeah, all right. 100%. And how do you manage kind of things coming up like that that are kind of out of your control? How do you deal with that? Well, it goes back to what I said with mindset, I think. It's knowing what you can't control mm. and being able to let go. When I say let go, meaning... Uh, you're always going to have tribulations and problems in a business, right? It's how you deal with them. Right. Like I said, it's it's understanding that this is not in your control. Unfortunately, it didn't go as planned. Mm. And I wish I could make him give us that sign-off if I had to go back, but it's out of my control. And pivot, you know, and the one thing I, I, I focus in my business is when something pops up is you, you, your attention goes where your focus goes. So... Mm. I try to focus on outcomes, not focus on the problem. When you focus on an outcome, you'll find right. the solution. So that's my approach. Got it. Understood. And um, what advice would you give someone, uh, a young investment manager starting right now, when it comes to raising capital and finding deals? How should they start this process? Someone that's new in the business, first yep. time? Yeah. Partner up with a, with a, you know, go work for somebody like us. You know, someone that wants to get in the space that has, maybe they have, you know, capital raising capabilities right, yeah. or they understand real estate if you're a first guy and you know if you understand the business or you've bought something on your right. own and you know we were buy before syndicating we were you know buying our own stuff we yeah. didn't have you know we weren't we didn't start a syndicator so we had to have a track record before going out to our first investor and second investor you have to prove yourself you know so do it yourself for the most part and then show that you know what you're doing mm. and then at some point people will want to give you money right 100 percent and um, tell us a little bit about s uh, switching your focus from Brooklyn to Manhattan. Um, what do you see as the primary difference between these two markets? And what does it take to succeed in each of these? So Manhattan is, 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 is very unique in itself. Is that it's, I think Manhattan, just not outside of just comparing it to Brooklyn, it's, I think it's unique in the, in the whole country. I think there's no, no place like Manhattan. Right. There's other thriving markets, but Manhattan is it's such a dense, unique city with literally everything in front of you yeah. and um understanding the pockets within manhattan understanding you know what the typical renter because our clients are renters mm. in each market what they look for you know are they families you know are they young professionals are they students and understanding how to, how the renovation of that unit or the lack of renovation would affect rents and what that tenant looks for um 
you know, we have stuff from, like I said, from here, from Little Italy to Hell's Kitchen to Brooklyn Heights. And I can tell you they're all, they're all different tenants. So understanding right. your tenancy is very important when you're getting into that space. Understood. And what's a, what's a creative way to add value to us, to a rent stabilized multifamily building? Rent stabilized multi, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, we own remote, we own some stabilized stuff and not typically a fan of that space right yeah. now. For obvious reason, rent laws are not on our side. Um, it's very difficult to make money on the rent stabilized yeah. stuff. You know, I think the, the, the older money guys who have the portfolios, the hundreds of thousands of units, whatever it might be, those guys can buy those. And I think at some point the rent laws are going to change. So if you have patient capital, I think a smart buy for long term would be that stuff. Mm. If you're getting it at a very high cap rate today. Right. Um, but you, on all these rent stabilized stuff, you need vacancies. You need vacancies. And uh, if you don't have vacancies on a rent stabilized unit, you're, you're, your you're hands doomed. are tied, man. <laughs> yeah, for Sorry. sure. And what's your what's your most exciting type of deal to work on? If I see a vacant building anywhere in a prime area, like I'm stopping what I'm doing, I'm going to see it, or awesome. I'll send an LOI without even having to go. Sometimes. Awesome. Okay, great. And um, what what are your primary like uh, metrics to evaluate a deal? Cap rate, location, potential for value add. Cap rate going is not important for us because on a vacant building, obviously it's a zero cap. Yeah, yeah. And we don't look at it like what it is today. We look at what we can build it to. Right. So location and basis are probably our two biggest things. You know, where it is, where we think the market is in that area, what the price per foot is. Price per foot is key because, you know, I don't believe you make money. Obviously, you, you, you realize an investment when you, when you sell, but right. you make money on the buy. Yeah. And if you don't buy well, Gotta buy it, right? it yeah. means nothing. On a down, that's how you protect yourself on a down market as well. So I think just buying well. Mm, got it. And can you walk us through some of your investments outside of New York? Um, give us one deal that went really well and one deal that didn't go as planned. So we own, we closed our first multi out of state in just a little over a year ago. Okay. Um, two over 200 apartments in Houston. So some of the stuff that didn't go as planned there is, you know, they had a very high occupancy and the seller had told us that um, the property was cash flowing X, but mm. they had a lot of bad debt, tenants that weren't paying. So, they, you know, the, the cash flow was filtered, unfortunately. Um, had to fire a contractor who didn't do as promised, took other jobs. Um, it was also during the time of inflation, so construction costs went up for us. Mm. Um, the last thing now that happened now is unfortunately it's a nationwide issue. It's not really, it's, it's not, it's not really a King's capital issue is that it, the rise of insurance costs across the board is affecting every guy, yeah. every, every sponsor. So you really couldn't predict that, you know, nobody really knew what that was going to be, but they've gone up significantly 30 to 50% in some mm. markets, sometimes double I'm hearing in Florida, it's crazy. Um, and just pivoting from that, you know, uh, thankfully our rents were, we were able to achieve higher rents than we projected, so we're in a good place. So I think regardless of when we sell, that it will still be a good deal at the end of the day. Understood. Okay. And um, how important are politics in the real estate game? Politics? And how do you navigate that world? So unfortunately, New York City, it's, uh, it's a Not big, in favor. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know... Again, this is my opinion. I'm not a politician. Right. And again, I'm just, you know, I hope uh, I don't offend anybody by saying certain things. But, you know, I just feel like politicians are out there to be politicians and get votes. Yeah. So unfortunately, they passed a lot of laws that are pro tenant. Not that unfortunately, it's not even being pro tenant. They just made things that are so far one sided where it doesn't allow landlords to to do what they need to do. Yeah. You know, and just as far as it's simple things like renovating an apartment, you know, so. Unfortunately, regulatory, you have, I think, the stat was close to 20,000 shelved apartments in New York City. Yeah. 20,000, 20, 20, yeah. 20,000 empty apartments that are shelved in New York City, um, which is a direct correlation to poor politics. Yeah, 100%. And um, how do you kind of set yourself apart with brokers so that um, they call you first when they have a good deal and th that comes across their desk? So the main thing is, I mean, you have to get along you have to like it has to be a relationship I mean, you have to have, you 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 work with people you like that's right. just how it is right so you know we try to befriend you know we get relationships with all our brokers mm. you know anybody we close with specifically we, we've socialized with we have personal relationships with a lot of the bigger shops you know we we've dinners we go out we socialize 
Um, but I think further from that, you, you know, everybody, it's good to be friends, but you, you have to execute. You know, that's the biggest thing. So right. doing what you say is very important. And the one thing our shop does very well, to credit to my guys, is that they're on point with their feedback. And when a broker gives us something, we will give a yay or nay. And if it is a nay, we're, we'll explain to them explain, what yeah. we don't like about it. And we'll tell them where we need to be. And, you know, it's about just letting them know what we need to make a deal work and just being transparent. Understood. So you, would you say you go about it by putting yourself in the broker's shoes and kind of looking at things from different angles? Sure. Yeah, for sure. I was a broker many years ago right. and, you know, it was a pet peeve when you give, you know, you work hard on a deal and you give it to somebody and you, you want them just to acknowledge and respond. And that's fine. And, you know, I'm sure owners like myself, will see hundreds of deals a week. Right. And of those hundred, maybe 10 are interesting. Maybe you put, you know, LOIs on, on half of those, you yeah. know, and at the end of the day, when you're communicating with the broker and have that relationship, they understand. If a broker understands where you, you know your th your methodology and how yeah. you think, they can do their part. They can help you better. They can help me better. They can by their part, they're they're able to execute a deal on their side. If so, that's the, that's just the biggest thing. One hundred percent. Yeah. And um, what has been um, the most difficult point in your career, and how did that kind of shape you as an individual from that point on? Most difficult point in my career. Um, it's a deep question. I'd probably say when we were transitioning, because a lot of the stuff we were we bought initially, you know, they were smaller buildings, three, six unit buildings. Mm. And getting comfortable with the larger assets, you know, working with investors, the failures, like you mentioned, about getting rejected with investors, because at the end of the day, you can't take it personal. Um, Getting into a new market like Texas was a major challenge for us. Mm. So I can't, I don't think there was one, I can't highlight one, but buying our first Manhattan property, I'll tell you one, it's, it's funny now, um, the building we bought on Mulberry at the time when we signed that contract was August, 2020. And at the time, Street Easy came out with a, an article that said there was, I think 15 to 20,000 vacant apartments mm. due to COVID. Okay, yeah. And it was extremely difficult to underwrite a deal at that time because Pre-COVID, you know, March, February, March, 2020, we were at a high. And now we're at all-time high yeah. vacancy. Yeah. And there was no end in sight of where this, could, where this, when this was coming around. So I had to, convincing people to come in this deal was a major challenge for us. Our first Manhattan deal, middle, it, was, it wasn't so much about us. I think it was more about COVID and people not trusting where things were. Uncertainty. Uncertainty, but looking back on it now, it, it was probably the the best deal we've ever done. Mm. You know, if I if I had to go back, I I could buy if I, I could buy fifty More, of them, I would, yeah. and not even think twice. Awesome, great. And how do you go about setting goals for yourself and for your company? So we actually did this pro we did this actually a few weeks ago with my guys. You know, started the new year. So at the end of the year, we typically I, I do a, I do a thing with them where I sit down and I have them reevaluate themselves and see what worked and what didn't work and understanding what didn't serve you, what are the things that you could have done better and articulate that into goals. So, you know, I had my guys write down the top five goals mm. and then I had them basically write the how, like you have a goal, it's great, now how are you going to get there? Mm. And then further from that, you know, the next, the follow-up to that was, what are the habits you have to create to achieve those goals? And what is the person you have to become to maintain those habits? Because mm. like the analogy I gave to my guys the other day is anybody can hit a jump shot, but you're a jump shooter. And it, you know, it's great to, to get a deal done, but the, we're not here. We're not a one it's hit the wonder. Yeah. It's about becoming something. Yeah. When, and those goals that I'm putting forth, I want my guys, and it includes myself, my team, my partners, is to become something better. So it's you know this high standard of, this is where we want to be and, and a detailed outline of how we're going to get there. Very specific. Awesome. Great. And um, how would you describe what sets you apart um, at King's Capital? What, what, set up, what sets apart your strategy? As a company? Yeah. So we're very good at layouts. You know, mm -hmm. like I said, like obviously, you know, everyone can say that, but we're able to reposition an asset and maximize space. You like no others. We, mm -hmm. we, you know, we have a three bedroom apartment that's 550 square feet getting crazy numbers with a lot of people would they laugh when I tell certain brokers they they can't they can't understand right. it 
but we on the, because of my rental background i guess we we were able to just get a not a, i wouldn't say a lead but understanding how to maximize the space and what to put in the space you know because we have little besides the finishes little amenities within the units mm. that from heated floors to chillers wine coolers a lot of things that tenants look at us and when they see our space they 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 truly stick out mm. our, our units definitely stick out and from buying from bed to manhattan we've on a rental market and I, again I, i'm knocking on wood somewhere virtually but we've been we were able to hit rents much higher than market mm. because of that. Right, I understand. So I think that's that's probably our biggest thing. Great, awesome. And um, what is the secret to effective negotiation? Listen first. Mm. Um, a lot of people think you, when you negotiate, you gotta t you gotta talk people into yeah. doing something. You know, so you know, there's a great book, Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you've heard of it. It's but a great one. Yeah, yeah, it's a great book. I, I get, you know, all my guys, I've given it to them and. Pick up little things from him. I think he's uh, he's an FBI, you know, hostage negotiator. So a lot of the, the, the tips he used, I try to mimic yeah. again. I'm far from that, but you know, the one thing I picked up is, is listen first, make the person feel understood, right? Be compassionate, understand what you, you know. If, is there something they're not telling you? And just try to ask questions that would kind of lead somebody into right. thinking they're giving you what you what you want when it's really what they want. Um, what's your uh, biggest missed opportunity? The biggest missed opportunity? Probably not buying more in COVID. Mm. You know, that's one regret I had, not being more aggressive. Um, there's always, there's a couple of deals, you know, and, you know, I, I, I have this actually with my guys and I hope they can, you know, we're very good, like I said, at the feedback and we've submitted LOIs and stuff. Mm. And, you know, our biggest success is when you hang around the hoop, meaning that, you know, we're the guys that, we're on top of the brokers, mm. we're on top of the sellers, and just, just being there and knowing that when timing is right on their side, that you're there. Um, I guess the lack of follow-up sometimes, you know, mm. you get busy, things happen, life happens, and just not following up on all the deals that, you know, so once in a while you'll see something yeah. trade, yeah. and you're like, damn, I had that deal. <laughs> it, hurts. it does sting a little bit. Got it. And what do you look for in a new hire? What do we look for? You know, first and foremost, we're, we're character guys. Everybody in my office, I can, I, you know, from the partners to my junior guys, they're they're great people. First and foremost, you right. have to have a head on your shoulders. You got to be a good guy. You have to be diligent. Self starters are one thing in real estate. You have to be a self starter. Everyone's, right. you know, to some extent, you you have to get yourself going because it's not the type of business you can, you're gonna go in and day one, guns blazing, and you know, take over the world. You just ha you have to be able to uh, start small. Be patient, you know, and again, being able to pers persevere. I, one of my guys wanted to quit. You know, it was, he's, he was 19 years old and it was four months in and he was struggling and, you know, I had a talk with him and got him on the phone with some other people I knew in the industry and fast forward, he stayed and, you know, he's, he's made over six figures in his first year awesome. because he stayed with it. He works hard and, you know, I just think that having guys that can stay with stay on the road and understand that it's not a it's not a short game it's a long game right um again honest good people and you know hard workers and you know I, I have this mentality that it's it's a whatever it takes mentality you know like you can't there's no excuses i hate excuses you right. know i think excuses don't get you nowhere i think you have to be accountable and if you do whatever it takes that's that's those are the type of guys i look for right and would you say it's it's that mindset of um thinking how can you make this work instead of why it can't work like a, a shift to the focus. Yeah, hundred percent. You change your focus. Energy. We, what's the expression that uh, where focus goes, energy flows. Yes. So you know. So, hundred percent. Like it's going. It's it's looking at things from a different angle. Right. And you know, what does this really mean? Like, what what exactly is happening here? And altering that focus to. How can it be done? Exactly. Okay. How, how do we achieve this? Again, it goes, I I use the, I always the term thinking outcomes. When you think in outcomes, you can find you can awesome. find the road. Great, amazing. And what would you say makes a good leader and a good principal? Respect, first and foremost. I think you got to respect, you know, knowing you're not better than anybody else, be humble. Mm. You know, just because I'm a partner in a company doesn't mean I'm going to treat any of my junior guys, my property manager, my rental broker. Mm. You know, nobody's better than anybody else. We're, we're all 
we're all yeah, I'm very religious. We're right. all from God, in my opinion, and we came from so we came from the, from the earth, and we all will go back to the earth. So, being humble and respectful of everybody, you know, you have to be compassionate. You know, knowing that you don't know everything, and just because I have an opinion on something doesn't mean you have to feel that way. So, right. knowing that I don't know it all, and it allows me to listen and and try to be compassionate, understand everybody's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, be accountable, you know, doing what you say, executing, um, and just being supportive, you know, you know, especially when you're training new guys, like they, they have questions, they want to learn, they want to succeed, right? So being there for them and trying to and try to be that, that, that shoulder that they can lean on and right. ask you a question and just just be available. Awesome. And who, who do you learn from at this point in your career? Who do I learn from? So, you know, I think it's, it's a, that's a moving target, right? We're always learning, in my opinion, regardless of what, I, what I've achieved and where, you know, I do think that I'm still a student of the game in many ways. Uh, every day you're learning. Um, there's always somebody better. There's always somebody that's doing more. So, you know, I'm looking at the bigger guys and what are they doing and how are they growing and what are they doing differently? You know, how do they grow faster? You know, what are they doing to, to speed up construction? Mm. What are they, you know, what are other people doing on the debt side that's helping them? And, you know, it's, it's, all, it's the guys who are doing things a little bit better than us. That's who, that's Got who I'm trying to learn from. Understood. Um, how did you offer value as a young professional when you were networking with industry veterans? How did I network? Yeah. So being out there, you know, there's always events. You know, the ICSC was the first, probably the first thing I ever went to in Vegas. Mm. You know, it was re retail shopping show and I was out there networking with all the owners other brokers um, holiday time is a great time of year you know December every every big shop back in the I mean it's after COVID a lot of them didn't pick it back up but back mm -hmm. in the day was a great time a great way to meet people you know there's always these real estate happy hours networking there's been a lot more recently been happening um, out there you need to be out there events and you know if there are no events you need to be picking up the phone and and calling people and taking them out for coffee or, right. or a drink or something. You need to just be in front of people and just get your name out there. Most 100%. importantly, yeah. Um, and are you a morning or a night person? Can you be both? You can. <laughs> um, I feel great in the morning. You know, like I said, yeah. like it's, it's, I, you know, I'm happy to wake up early. I don't complain. Um, I don't have an alarm clock. I just, I just wake up. And, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, it's just, my body just wakes me up and, I feel great, you know, and it's, I feel at most, I probably at most, I feel at most peace, but uh, I enjoy being out with friends and family and, you know, I can be out to wee hours of the night like a lot of people know and yeah. I don't have a problem. So I, I enjoy both sides equally, awesome. I would say. Great. And uh, what, what do you do outside of work to kind of keep yourself centered and prevent burnout? Is it that morning routine that you kind of mentioned? Morning routine is definitely the first part. Yeah. But doing stuff for myself, you okay. know, that give me, give me joy. You know, I, I love to work out a lot. You know, grew up playing a lot of basketball. Mm. You know, that was that was a great way. I played in leagues. Um, love to travel. I like to get out of New York when I can, especially mm. when it's cold. Right. Um, and just being around good people. You know, like you know, going out with some of my best friends. You know, sharing a nice dinner, having a few drinks and laughs. I, you know, that's, that's my thing. Great. Awesome. And, um, what, what idea do you believe, whether grounded in data or intuition that many people you respect disagree with you on? That many people disagree with me on. Um, a lot of people think, you know, there was during COVID, I guess there was a, an influx of people that were leaving New York, going South, which is, for obvious reasons, you know, a lot of people, New York is done, New York is done, and that's, I kept hearing that, you know. I don't believe that at all. I, you know, in my belief that New York's not going anywhere. Mm. I do believe certain assets within New York, like office, um, will be a struggle. And I do think the rent laws make it difficult in New York, but I look at the rent laws as a pendulum, it's gonna swing. And I, I don't believe New York is going anywhere. Mm. I think there's a high demand, to my point earlier, I think that it's a very unique city mm -hmm. and there will always, always, always be a demand for someone and people want to live here. 100%. Great. And what drives you nowadays? Is it money, personal achievement, family, philanthropy? And when would you say you've succeeded? 
money doesn't drive me. As interesting as that sounds, I am a capitalist. Obviously, we all do things to make money. Right. But, you know, I believe that when you focus on productivity and when you do well, the money will follow. Right. Um, what drives me, honestly, is, you know, real estate, it gives you passive income, mm. you know? So getting to a point where I could relax, honestly, I'm looking to retire in Greece. Right. That's my goal. It's my awesome. dream. Maybe open up a hotel. and So having that passive income through everything I'm building, uh -huh. you know, to, I don't want to do that when, you know, it's unfortunate people work till they're much older right. and then get to, you know, you're limited to what you can enjoy. I'm trying to speed that up as much as possible. Great. So my dream is to, to have enough passive income. That's what I think I made it where I don't need to work where I want to work. Or I'm going to, I'm never going to stop, but mm -hmm. it's, it, it'll be, I want it to be more of a choice versus a need. Right. And at that point, when you have free time, you know, to your, to your other point, philanthropy is a big for me. You know, I, f I feel great. I'm a member awesome. of my church, my community. I give back. I'm on the board. And, you know, it, it gives you, it gives me great joy, honestly, you know, and when I'm working with people and giving up my time. So outside of retiring, I see myself doing a lot of that as well. Awesome. Great. And I have my final question to wrap it up. What advice would you give your 22 year old self about life, business and relationships? Life, business, and relationships. So with business, I guess I'll bring it back to what I said. I, I probably would have fast forward if I could have got into this in my Mentally. early 20s. I probably would have made that choice now. What it said, if you're able to buy properties, I'm 43 now, 20 years ago, you know, what that would look like today. Right. And it's scary. It's funny. I find emails from time to time of deals that I had 10, 15 years ago. And it's amazing where prices have gone. So... My advice would be to get into real estate much earlier okay. and train with somebody and learn and then go off on your own or be a part of that, or find a way to bring value to that company where you're involved. Um, on the life side, um, work on your mind as much as you work on your body. Like, mm. you know, a lot of things, a lot of people work out, play sports, and it's great. And I, I, I love that stuff. But knowing if you, the moment you can control your mind and your thought process, it's a game changer for me. Like, in, in, that's the one advice I would have told myself is work on trying to train yourself much earlier. And um, life, I would just say, you know, don't overestimate what you could do in one year and underestimate what you could do in 10. Mm. Don't be hard on yourself, you know. Self-love is very important. At the end of the day, everyone's trying to do the best, you know. We all do our best sometimes if things don't go as well and just not beat yourself up and, you know, just learn. Learn and grow, learning, you know, don't look at things as, as a setback, as a failure, look at it as a learning, mm. learning experience and take something out of that uh, and grow and just, you know, stay the course, don't give up. Awesome, great. George, this has been so amazing and there's so much value to be gained from this and young people can apply this to their lives moving forward. Thanks again for doing Thank this. Thank you for having me, John. It's been Thank a pleasure. You. Thank you. Awesome. That was great. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate it.